If someone showed up to study the American culture and knew nothing about it, what would, they, what would it look like when they wrote their chapter on December? Right? What, would, what would mark this month as different? What would mark this month as holy? Holy. We, there are multiple words the church has that get kind of churchish and we lose their, their understanding, their meaning, and holy is one of them. Like repent, repent means turn, turn from something stupid to do something smart. That's what repent means, it's turn. Or uh, reconcile, it, it, it means rebuild. And, and holy is one of those words. Well, things are holy. What's holy mean? Holy means different. Well, that's all it really means is what is different, right? How is this month set apart? If we were going, if someone came to study American culture and was to study this month, how would this month be set apart from the rest of the year? What makes this set of four weeks different? Well, my email tells me that it's the best time of year to get uh, sales. It's the best time of year to go shopping. I get catalogs and flyers and ads telling me all about the th ways I can save, which combined with this, uh, this pressure, this is the time of year that we go hunting for the perfect gift, the gift that is novel and, and special and practical and, and meaningful. And, um, and, if we don't, there's this, and if you don't pick the perfect gift, like, I can see the commercial that, it, I've never seen it aired, but like, there's this, this sense of like you're, someone's opening your gift, and they hold it up, and it's not the right one, and I can see the way the commercial would have all the Christmas music stop, and everyone would like stare at you, because you didn't get the perfect gift. 30% off at Kohl's this weekend. I mean, there's this, this, is the, this is the month when we all go shopping uh, so that we can find what, what we need or what we're told we need. Combine that with a, a busyness. This is a month when things seem to get very busy. busy and and uh, it's when it starts getting dark earlier and it gets cold. And to be busy when it's cold and dark at night is uh, really kind of annoying. But uh, that's, that's what sets this month apart. Especially when, not that I have small children, you can't just like wrap Fletcher up in a blanket and toss him in the back. He actually has to be dressed. And uh, <laughs> it just makes everything a bit more challenging. The month of December can be rather stressful, and then it leads to the month of January, which I call the month of reckoning, because that's when the credit card bill shows up. And uh, so, yeah, that would be what is holy. What Mark sets this time apart as different than the rest if you were just going to study American culture. If we turn to scripture, what sets this time apart? What sets this time apart, if you start with the stories of the shepherds, is uh, the whole story star starts not with the, the craziness of Black Friday and the running and the bustling. The way the story starts in scripture is with silence. Right, we read that one verse, uh, and, and you read like one verse that says the shepherds were in, watching their, sharp, their sheep in the darkness of, of the night. And it's easy to rush on to the next verse when the action starts. But like they're out there, having been out there night after night after night, and that's what they do. Right? And so they are out in the dark, the comfortable silence. That's how this story begins. And into this silence, a small pinprick of light shines in the sky, and it starts to grow. And out of this light that grows comes the music of angels who come to share the news that they should not be afraid that there is a great and joyful event for a child has been born, and you are to go look for him, a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. And with this good news, the skies burst open, and the angels are joined by an angelic choir singing glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. And the, then the shepherds drop everything and they run to find the child and then they rejoice and they tell Mary and Joseph what they have seen and heard and they go out to spread this good news about this gift. And so what makes this time holy in scripture, what makes it different, what sets it apart is the silence. Right? The most of the story is the shepherds in silence. 
And then the light breaking forth, the supernova, supernova exploding across the sky from a star that destroyed itself long ago in the light traveling across and hitting at this exact moment as a child is born. And then this gift arrives, this child is born. And there is plenty of time to ponder this gift. This is not a, a month that's in any hurry. It's taking its time, right? The first gift to be unwrapped for Christmas is the gift of the child. When is the second gift of Christmas unwrapped? Wrapped. It's when the wise men show up. How long does it take the wise men to show up? Two years, right? Two years. And they only leave when the star lights off in the sky. So the first gift of Christmas is unwrapped. And they don't touch, another gift isn't given for another two years. Like this is not a story that's in a hurry. It's taking its time. It's letting everything unfold as it is. I like that story. I feel kind of busy right now. Maybe you do too, I don't know. I like this story a lot more. A time with plenty of comfortable silence, lights, music. A gift that's given, the one gift, the gift that gets plenty of time to be appreciated, the gift that always fits and needs no batteries. This is the story of these weeks. This is the story that is different than the rest of the year of what makes Advent and Christmas holy, of this moment when a loving and creating God chooses to create a new way forward for us. And how do we accept that gift and then give in kind, to give in, in the same way? It's a story that we gather to hear and worship as a church. And this is where that story belongs. Every year there seems to be some sort of kerfluffle about, uh, like, do you get wished Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays when you walk into the mall? Or Starbucks, that was what they caught flack. Was it Starbucks last year, what was on their cups? Do we really care what Starbucks has on their cups? Do we need Starbucks to tell the story of Jesus Christ? And if we do, we, woo, we have bigger problems, right? I don't trust Starbucks or Pennies or Mall Greeters to get the story of Jesus Christ right. This is where we take the time to get the story right. To listen, to ponder, to let that silence, let that beauty go. But, Pennies can say whatever it wants to when I walk in, right? We gather in worship to tell our story. As, and as you saw in this video that I shared with you, and I hope you all could see it, and if you didn't see it, it will be pasted on our uh, web, uh, Facebook page, and you can find it online. But um, as this lays out, the one way to sort of practice this story is to begin as we have today, worshiping, worship fully, and then it goes through, buy less, give more, love all. And if it sounds like there are four Sundays in Advent and there are four topics, that lines up nicely, doesn't it? All right, so that's what we'll be talking about over these next weeks. How do we buy less next week so that then we can give more of what, what matters, what truly are gifts that are, are desired and needed, and, and wrapping up with how do we love all, all people. Now, as we start to do this, I know that every family celebrates Christmas in its own way, and so there, there'll be questions asked and ponderings, and there'll be things that you, you need to discuss with your own family about how you celebrate Christmas. And every family will celebrate differently, and every family will move at its own rate. And so I know some families that they watched this, they, they, they thought about it, and they went whole hog. They don't give gifts anymore that are tangible. What they give is they give each other their vacation vacation time, and so all the family goes on vacation at the same time right after Christmas, so they give each other a week, right? And that's a gift that always fits and is always wonderful, right? That's, that's what they have done. Other families I, I know of, they, uh, they stopped giving, one of, everyone gets something from everybody, they, they drew names, you get one gift, and that way it freed up resources that they give to a charity that the whole family cares about. And there are options you can consider, but you'll figure it out at your own rate, um, on your own family, in your own, in your own time, so it's okay. And it changes over time. Olivia and I, when we first saw this video and we were thinking about it years ago, uh, we didn't have children. <laughs> Now we have children. That, that sure does change things, doesn't it? <laughs> um, as we start doing this, that's where we, we start. But no matter where you are with your family regarding how to celebrate the story of Jesus' birth, I want to invite you to join with me in doing one thing. I want you to think about water. 
40% of the world, of people in the world, are water insecure, which means that they can't count on having clean water. And if you can't count on having clean water, that means 1.5 million children will die from diarrhea this year. And it's a, break that down, that's 4,000 a day, 171 an hour. That's according to the World Health Organization and UNICEF. Over the last seven years, the Missouri Conference of the Methodist Church has been working with Haiti to help them uh, get clean water. And, and in the process, we, we, have, we didn't go in saying, we know what to do, and here we go. We went, we went in and said, let's try something. We started digging wells. And uh, we realized as we learned working with them that... Um, Wells aren't what people need. Because it's not that they can't get water, it's that the water is dirty. It's, it's, they get cholera, diarrhea, they get these diseases from them. And so what we have learned is the best way to help someone in a way that's sustainable and, pow and empowering is you give them a filter. It's about the size of your hand. It's based on the technology used for dialysis pumps. It costs 50 bucks, it, lost, it lasts 10 years, right? 50 bucks, one family, clean water, 10 years. I can't get my mind around uh, the big numbers. Like, that, that video is a few years old now. We now, America, go us. We're now spending $600 billion a year on Christmas. High five, right? Yippee. And now it would cost about $30 billion to take care of world water. I don't understand those numbers. They're too big. But 50 bucks, I can get my mind around that. So, I invite you to join with me. This is the first gift that the Kuhn family is giving for Christmas. Y'all don't think twice about getting clean water out of these, do you? But I'm going to invite you to fill this with the gift of clean water for families. This will be here the entire month of December during worship. It will be in the office uh, during the week. If you want to come up during the time we take up offerings, before worship, after, whenever, uh, this is your opportunity to give your first gift, the gift that is needed. Four families will have clean water. That's the Coons family the gifts. I invite you to join me in telling this story well, the story of the gift of Jesus Christ, the story that begins with silence and ends with what we most need. Amen. <laughs>